But dear and gracious God, we are thankful to you for the breath of life and for the gift of this day, especially for the gift of your presence with us in this day. We ask for your grace to be with us as we seek to understand and to perceive your will through your word. Open our hearts and minds to receive it, O God, and I pray for your help as I share your word today. May it not return void, but may it accomplish that which you intended for it to accomplish. In the mighty name of Jesus the Christ, amen. amen. Well, it's good to be with you, like I said. Uh, we're going to be looking at a particular uh, passage to begin with, but we'll be moving quickly from that. Please turn in your Bibles uh, to John's Gospel, chapter 8, starting at verse 31, and we'll go through 36. Has everybody got a Bible? It's kind of hard to have a Bible study without a... Well, never mind, never mind. Okay. Now hear this Word of God as it is found in this passage. To the Jews who had believed Him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We're Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. For the sins of the reading, may God add understanding to this, His holy word. Amen. Amen. I'm sure most of us have heard parts of this, phrase, uh, this passage. We've heard phrases from it. Most of the time, I've even heard it on a, a TV commercial, but most of the time you hear it in the form of, the truth will set you free. Sometimes they get really uh, out there and they say, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And that's become kind of the pop culture vernacular. You'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But that's not what Jesus said. It's conditional. He said, if you continue or hold to, or some translations say, if you abide in or remain in my teaching... If you abide in my word, if you hold to my teaching, you will really be my disciples. And then the sequence, or at least the understanding that comes with all of that is, if you remain in my teaching, you will then know the truth. And that truth will set you free. It's not just any, any truth, not just anybody's truth, but the truth of God, which is found in Jesus Christ, will set you free. But it's conditioned upon holding to the teaching of Jesus. And it means to continue believing and to continue in obedience to it. It's one thing to believe something, but if it doesn't shape how you live, you're not really believing it. You know, I may believe that the moon is cheese, but how am I going to eat it? Right? Being able to do uh, what it says is really the test of true discipleship, he says. He's not, doubting your, he's not doubting our salvation, anything like that, but he's saying, if you hold fast to my word and put it into action and are obedient, you're showing evidence that you are my disciples came a time in Jesus' ministry on earth where he said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and then don't do the things that I tell you to do? <clears throat> Another gospel puts it in uh, kind of a reverse order, but he's saying, uh, in that day, that is in the great getting up morning that we're talking about in Revelation, um, people, many will come to me, me and say, Lord, didn't we do all these fantastic things? Didn't we preach on the on the streets and didn't we deliver you people from demons and didn't we work miracles in your name and all these things and he'll say I never knew you depart from me you workers of evil 
Why, why, did they not, why did he not know them? It was because there was not a living relationship with Jesus Christ that was informed by his word and followed by making that what we live out. So he's saying, remain, hold fast, abide in my teaching. And notice, too, there's a connection here between uh, knowing the truth and being free. Having real liberty. They misunderstand him to be thinking about geopolitical freedom. You know, they're saying, we've we're the sons of Abraham. We've never been slaves. They say right around the corner from the Roman army headquarters, you know. <laughs> they were already an occupied nation, but Jesus said, look, whoever is a slave to sin, which you are, is not free. You're dominated by it. But the son is not dominated by it. Whoever remains in my teaching will be free. The Son will set you free, and you will be free indeed. So you'll know the truth by knowing His Word and remaining in it. You'll know the truth about God and God's Christ. You'll know the truth about the world. You'll know the truth about sin. And you'll know the, wor the truth about yourself. And how God's Word impacts all of those things. It's a life-changing, world-changing dynamic to rest and remain in the teaching and life, the very spirit life of Jesus the Christ. And that's what he's urging upon these folks and each of us. So I want you to turn now uh, to uh, Titus Chapter 1, verse 9. It's a passage, uh, it's actually a letter that doesn't get a whole lot of play sometimes. We do a lot of work with Paul's, gospel, uh, with Paul's letters, but this is one to Titus that comes after the Timothys, and sometimes we don't give it a whole lot of attention. But at verse 9, he's talking about whoever would be a leader in the church, essentially, whoever would be an elder. Verse 9 he says, he, pardon the, pardon the phrase he, but it's whoever is a leader, must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. What does it mean, as it has been taught? Do we mean like we learned it in elementary school all the way through high school? No. He's talking about as it was taught to you by the apostles. See, Titus and these people of his generation had the, the, the privilege of having the apostolic ministry in their presence. Those people had sat at the feet of Jesus and had been schooled by Jesus all this time. Three years plus. He had ordained them, given them the power to preach the word with power. And they came throughout the known world, ultimately, preaching this truth about Jesus and the gospel. And Paul is writing to Titus, someone who's been converted to the Christian faith, someone who's been left to uh, exercise leadership and to help to develop new leaders in the church. And he's saying that whoever you work with needs to be able to know, first of all, the truth of Jesus Christ and be willing to continue to communicate it as it has been taught. And that's the challenge for the church all through the history of humanity is to teach that message as it has been taught. It's a big challenge. Yes, because everybody thinks they have a better idea, you know. <laughs> now, some time ago, I, I was with you and I talked to you uh, at Paul's request about the development of uh, historical philosophical liberalism. 
uh, German liberalism with Schleiermacher and all those people. And we left off really at um, the Second Great Awakening, I think it was. But we had talked about the ways in which the church's effort to teach the truth of the gospel, how it had been attenuated and brought back into focus uh, many times, but in a great way at the, at the Reformation when Luther recovers the teaching of Christ. Um, and that is that salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ alone, according to the scripture alone, by faith alone, or through faith, I should say, by grace alone. That truth was recovered and it just revolutionized all of Europe and a lot of the new colonies in America. But things began to work against it again. And we continue to have things that just chip away at the, at the gospel message. Over and over and over, that's the church's challenge. And I'm not saying that, you're, that we're exempt. I'm saying that we're all responsible. It's not just the preachers and pastors and teachers that have to be uh, willing to talk about the message as it, ha as it has been taught. But hearers have to have the knowledge of what has already been taught so that correction can come when people begin to stray and get off the railroad track here. So there's a responsibility of all Christians, hearers and speakers alike, to know the truth and to not depart from the truth. There's an emphasis in First and Second Timothy and Titus to um, r remain with sound doctrine. It does, that phrase is not found in the other letters of Paul or Peter or the, or the general epistles. But they're found eight times in these letters that I mentioned, the pastoral epistles. Because he's giving direction to people who oversee the life of the church and people who participate in the life of the church. And this idea about sound doctrine doesn't just mean uh, something that is learned by rote. It's talking about what is true, what is in keeping with the teaching of Christ, which the apostles handed down, which is our responsibility to receive with faith. Every one of us. Why? Because if you don't believe it, you're not remaining in His Word. And if you don't remain in His Word, you won't know the truth. And if you don't know the truth, you're not going to be free spiritually. So every single one of us has it uh, incumbent upon us to listen for sound doctrine, to insist on sound doctrine, and to speak sound doctrine when we're talking about church and biblical matters. Now, I'm thankful to God that Paul and the staff and many in this church are focusing on this. So please don't take this as a criticism. It's a life that's changing. God send. But every one of us encounters people, probably by the time we go to lunch or, or dinner at least, we encounter people who have a different op opinion, a different agenda, and a different story. But we need to know Jesus' story. We need to know the truth so that we're not beat about by other people's version of it. Am I making sense? Yes. Okay. Any questions, comments, or random outbursts? <laughs> okay. We'll move on then. We're to hold firmly to it. By the way, this, this word, uh, let me just mention about this word sound doctrine. It also means health giving or healthy doctrine. And there's a place in, uh, in the scripture where he talks about those who veer away from sound doctrine are very much like a disease or a, a microbe that gets into the human body and begins to infect it and produce the equivalent of spiritual gangrene. Some translations use that word. But sound doctrine brings health and healing, spiritual healing to individuals and the church at large. So that's what's important about it being sound doctrine. Well, why this focus on it? Why all this, uh, what's so important about this? I want us to look real quick. And by the way, I don't intend us to look at all the scriptures, all eight of the scriptures about sound doctrine. 
Those are there for you to look at at your leisure. I just used the one from Titus. But I want to show you what's really going on. What's, what's, what's going on behind what's going on? Turn, if you will, to Matthew 13. That's in the New Testament, by the way. <laughs> right? Isn't that right? <laughs> okay. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus begins to use parables to teach uh, his disciples and to befuddle those listeners who are not really tuned in to following in his word. And he gives parables and he explains two of them, one about the sower and the seed and the soils. But the other one that I want to look at here is in chap chapter 13, starting at verse 24. And I'm going to read it, and then I'll skip down to the explanation. It says, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling up the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring, them, bring it into my barn. That's the parable. Now Jesus is going to tell them and us what it means. Down at verse 36. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. So he's already given you the entire scenery here and the cast of characters. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They, uh, they will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. The sons of the devil, he says, are in the midst of the sons of the kingdom. They're in our midst. They're growing among us. That's what he says in this explanation of the parable. And he's not going to just come in with a flamethrower and burn up everything because it would damage true believers. And so we struggle. We await that great getting up morning when the angels come and harvest the good seed, which are believers. And those that are the sons of the devil get bundled up and taken to the fire. Now, it's important for us to understand what goes on between the sons of the kingdom and the sons of the devil while we're waiting. And that's why I want you to look at Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> what happened in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3? God created the earth, right? Everything in it, including uh, the first couple. They kind of blew it. They opened a portal uh, allowing sin to come into God's perfect world. Uh, they were deceived by this serpent figure representing the devil. And in chapter 3, after God comes and confronts them about all this, he pronounces a curse upon this serpent. And this uh, passage, by the way, 
um, at verse 15, he says, I will put enmity, he's talking to the devil first. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring, that is the sons of the devil, and hers, that is the sons of the kingdom, and the king himself, Jesus the Christ, who is the seed of the woman that we talk about in Revelation. And Paul talks about in a few of his letters. He, that is, the, the, the Messiah, the son, the prince of the kingdom, will crush your head and, and you, devil, will strike his heel. So the, the heel of the Lord was struck at the cross. The devil will have his head crushed shortly. But meanwhile, he keeps planting weeds in God's garden, in his vineyard. And what happens is, he said, uh, there will be enmity, that is hostility, uh, and uh, outbreak of fight and disputes and discord and turmoil between the sons of the devil, the tares, the weeds, and the sons of the kingdom, that is, those who know the truth and are in the process of being set free. And that will go on until that great getting up morning. I love it when you call it that. Well, I have to, I have to attribute that to my theology professor, Glenn Rowdy. He used to say that all the time. The great getting up morning. Yeah, the great getting up morning. But what I want you to see here is that this story about the weeds and the good and the good wheat is not just a story in agriculture. It has ties all the way back to the very beginning where there was a cosmological disaster when man and woman uh, allowed sin into the world and became slaves of sin. And from that point on, this perfect garden that God had put them in Everything started to die. Everything became middle in Odessa. Okay? <laughs> Watch if they've got a wall down there now. <laughs> well, it's going to burn too. Yeah. <laughs> but everything started to die. And the devil has enmity between the one entity and himself that can give life. And that is God's promised one, the seed of the woman, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And he's going to do everything he can to wreck God's plan. He thought killing the Christ was going to do it, but it didn't work out that way. Well, there will be continual enmity and hostility, and his tactics against us as children of the kingdom are twofold. And I know Paul has talked about this in, in this Bible study uh, group a couple of times. Persecution of believers, and then if that doesn't work, seduction. seduction. They try to undermine. Notice that, that in that parable, it just occurred to me when I was reading it. The story is that the good seed was planted and while they were asleep, somebody sneaked in there and planted bad seed. It was while the church was asleep all this happens. Well, the church of Jesus Christ is not called to be asleep. He's come to wake us up. Okay? Is that why the pilgrim was told not to sleep? I don't know about all that. I'm, okay. I'm not a, I haven't read that whole deal in many years, so I'm not a part of that study. Oh, I'm sorry. But I know that we're, we're called to be awake and alert. So I think that's clue to your answer there. Yeah. Okay. But if persecution doesn't work, and there are many places all over this planet right now where people are being persecuted to death for their faith in Jesus Christ, we are very blessed at this juncture in our history so far that we are not in that category. We've not had that struggle. Our struggle is on the other end of things with seduction and with being lulled to sleep and with being fed things that sound pleasant but are false. 
Paul in his letter to the Romans there in chapter 16. Let's look at that real quick. Romans 16. Verse 17 and 18. I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Well, what have we been talking about? The weeds in that garden, right? Those at enmity with, with the children of the kingdom. Keep away from them, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Smooth talk and flattery is the common challenge of the church in this day. We're assaulted by smooth talk and flattery in the, in the North American church. Smooth talk. You just do your part and God will have to do His. <laughs> I can tell you how you can have your best life now. Smooth talk. Well, what about flattery? It's gotten to the point where in the church uh, we're even being made fun of them. Oh, it's not really unusual to be ridiculed, but it's one thing to be ridiculed for holding to the truth. It's another thing to be ridiculed for being so ridiculous that it's, it's a farce. And Stuart Smalley is a great example on Saturday Night Live. This is flattery. I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. And doggone it, people like me. And they're saying, you know, that's the extent of what some churches have been teaching. And unfortunately, it's true. So by smooth talk and flattery, the devil has a methodology of undermining the church. And God's people. What's the antidote to that? Remaining in the teaching of Christ. Know the truth. The truth, Christ's truth, will set you free. Then you will really be His disciples. You'll be free indeed. Now, it's interesting in this passage from Romans, just a couple of verses later, down at verse 19, everyone has heard about your obedience, so I'm full of joy over you, but I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. Now look at this. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Where do we just hear that? Back in Genesis, right? So the fight goes on. That's the same fight that was prophesied and predicted and the curse that was put on the serpent way back in Genesis 3.15. By the way, you probably already know this, but that verse is called the Proto-Evangelium. That's the first statement of, of the gospel and the coming of the, the seed of the woman. It's the first passage in the scripture about God's plan to redeem the fallen world that Adam and Eve had created. Okay? So... But it continues on in our day. Not just in the day of the Romans. We've got the same fight going on now. Okay, let's look at 1 Timothy 4 real quick. How are we doing on time? Okay. First Timothy 4, verse 1 and 2. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some translations say in the latter days, some, uh, the Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. And then it goes into a description of some of the things that they'll be teaching. Not all of them, obviously. So in the latter times, there will come deceiving spirits. Well, this is the same prediction that you really see talking about the enmity between 
uh, the devil's people and the Son of Man back in Genesis and in, in that Roman passage. But that phrase that says in, in later times, it's talking about the time from the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost until the coming of Christ to gather all of his people into his barn. The latter days um, began uh, when Peter, in his first sermon at Pentecost, chapter 2 in the book of Acts, quotes Joel's prophecy about the latter days. This is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel when he said that in the latter days, and then he talks about the coming of the Spirit, your sons and daughters will prophesy and so forth and so on. The beginning of what we call the church age. Consummated when Christ returns. So the Spirit says clearly that when that, when that began, hey, the big battle is on. The Spirit of Christ at war with the Spirit of the devil and his, and his minions. So don't be surprised if people in other countries in despotic places are undergoing all kinds of persecution. And don't be surprised if here we're almost lulled to sleep by vapid worship and false doctrine. Flattery and smooth talk. Anybody in here a blues fan, by the way? Don't raise your hand. Blues We're on camera. <laughs> blues music. Yes, there's a guy named Delbert McClinton. He had a song called Smooth Talk. Oh, yeah. He says, don't let the smooth talk fool you. Don't let the sharks get to you. <laughs> and he's talking about smooth talk and flattery. I heard the expression, too good to be true. Yeah, wow. that's probably right, too. But notice the source of this error that we're dealing with here is demonic. It's from the devil. It's not just somebody thinking up something wild and crazy. It has its origin in the pit of hell. So that source is demonic. You'll see an item C there near the bottom of the first page. As these teachers follow deceitful spirits... And false teaching results in apostasy. What's apostasy? It's a falling away from the faith. It's a falling away from the faith once delivered to the saints. What we were taught from the beginning. False doctrine leads to non-faith. So also 2 Timothy, just so we get a good healthy dose of what Paul's predicting here and warning about. And I've heard... Uh, I meant Paul the Apostle, okay? But I have heard Paul the pastor here talking about this very passage in chapter 4 of 2 Timothy, verses 1 through 5. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of His appearing... And his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. The word being the word from Christ, his teaching. Received by the teaching of the apostles. What we were originally taught. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct and rebuke. Uh-oh. And encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Why? Because the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship, because it will come, by the way. Do the work of an evangelist and discharge all the duties of your ministry. Remain in his teaching. Deliver what you have received from him and his anointed apostles. Written down in scripture. Now we say, well, what did he say? Well, what is his teaching? What are we talking about here? Well, read it and see. <laughs> read it and see, friends. That's why I wrote it down. And so we could read it and see. It's there. 
But when we start getting outside the pages of this thing, then we're in the category of false doctrine or potentially false doctrine. If you're basing your faith on anything that's not from the teaching of the apostles, coming straight from the Jesus the Christ, you might want to re-examine that. And if you're hearing anything like that at any of the conferences or places that you may go where they profess to be teaching uh, something about, about God, beware. Always listen carefully. Know the Word of God so you can discern what is true and what is not. Any questions, comments, random outbursts? Are you still with me? Okay. Well, let's go ahead and turn the page over. Anybody ever heard of William Williman? Um, he was the pastor of First Methodist Church in North Myrtle Beach, where I'm from, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, right after I left college. And he went on to be a bishop in Alabama and, uh, and so forth and so on. And some people said that he never had a thought that he didn't get published. But <laughs> he, uh, he's, he, he wrote the uh, introduction or preface, rather, to a book called Christless Christianity. And that's what we have to be on guard against, is Christianity without Christ. And I'm going to read you just an excerpt from the introduction to that. It's, it's there for you to see, but I'm going to read it so people who are watching can also hear it when they view the video. He says, Here we are in North American church, conservative or liberal, evangelical or mainline, Protestant or Catholic, emergent or otherwise, cranking along just fine, thank you. So we're busy downsizing, becoming culturally relevant, reaching out, drawing in, making disciples, managing the machinery, utilizing biblical principles, celebrating recovery, user-friendly, techno-savvy, finding the purposeful life, practicing peace with justice, utilizing spiritual disciplines, growing in self-esteem, reinventing ourselves as effective ecclesiastical entrepreneurs, and in general, feeling ever so much better about our achievements. Notice anything missing in this pretty picture? Jesus Christ is missing in this pretty picture. We're being sold a bill of goods if we tag along with these things. None of them in themselves are bad particularly, but they're not the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're not the teaching we're to abide in. Some years ago, um, some of you know I was an army chaplain for about 30 years, and uh, nobody escapes unscathed in the army chaplain, so you have to go to a number of schools even though you're already, already endorsed and ordained and um, promoted up the ranks and all this other kind of stuff. And I had to go, like everybody else, to the Army's Command and General Staff College. And it's a, it's a rather lengthy ordeal. But you have to do that if you want to get promoted above and not put out of the Army. So you do it. But I had to write a, a dissertation there like everybody else. And mine was back in the day. I mean, you've got to turn the clock way back. Uh, to the uh, late 80s, early 90s. And my, my study was about the origins and the methodology and the philosophy of what we used to call seeker-sensitive churches. It's still used in some churches. And the more I learned about it, the more I, uh, I started with the idea, well, this is great. We're going to try to reach out to people that uh, wouldn't come near the church otherwise. We're going to put in some rock music so those that are rockers can, and so forth and can come in and dig it, you know. We're going to streamline the worship service so they're not bogged down with a whole bunch of liturgy and all of this. And before you know it, there's no more prayer. <laughs> yeah, and you've got this guy in a polo shirt and a pair of blue jeans. It's all ubiquitous all over the place. There's this bar stool, a guy with blue jeans, polo shirt who comes and sits down in front of everybody and begins to do his imitation of Stuart Smalley. Now, I'm exaggerating 
But there's a lot of truth in this because we, as, a, as evangelicals, evangelical churches did this really with the best of intention of reaching out to those who are not Christian people. But somewhere along the way, they did not abide, and, and many churches did not abide in the teachings of Christ. Now, there are some who did. I don't mean to just blanket every church. There's some great uh, churches who have done that, but they have had to draw the line between being popular and being faithful. Sometimes you can't do both. You have to decide. Jesus says, be faithful. Remain in my word. Remain in my teaching. That's how you're going to be free. That's how you're going to know the truth. And if you don't, nobody else is going to know the truth through, through you anyway. Isn't that right? Okay. Well, about 12 years ago, a sociologist named Christian Smith, at the time he was at the University of North Carolina, I think he's at Notre Dame now, uh, but he and a, a, a team of researchers set out uh, to compass the entire North America, all the churches in North America, all kinds of churches, Protestant, Catholic, Mormon, Seventh-day Adventist, Jewish congregations, everybody. And they were trying to determine what are the major themes that uh, those in high school youth groups and those graduating that general age group, what is it that they are taught and believe about their faith? And everybody was shocked when the results came out because it showed that there was very little, uh, there's really no distinction. There are no faith distinctives in the major themes that people are being taught in all these churches. They come away with what he defined as moralistic therapeutic deism. They're not being taught the gospel in most churches. Whether it's Methodist, Presbyterian, Catholic, Anglican, Mormon, Jewish, you name it. They're all coming away with this culturally conditioned, probably, notion that he calls moral, uh, moralistic therapeutic deism. And you see the five tenets of that faith listed there. And by the way, those people are now uh, young adults, actually not so young anymore. Here's what they all believe. God created the world. Well, we're off to a good start. God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other as taught in the Bible and most world religions. Remember, this harkens back to that philosophical liberalism that I talked about, and Schleiermacher and Ritual and all those guys who were saying that, you know, the core of all religions has to do with the moral law. And therefore, they're all the same. Well, that's not true of Christianity. Just as a side note, Christianity is not about the moral law. It's about our failure to keep it and God's willingness to die on our behalf because of it. Okay? That's the gospel. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son so that whoever believes in Him shall not perish. Perish why? Because of their sin. But have everlasting life. It has nothing to do with keeping the law. Paul spent a whole lot of, a whole lot of lead writing about that. It's by faith in Jesus Christ and remaining in His teaching, not drifting out to some false doctrine. Anyway, item three, the central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. Smooth talk and flattery. God for, uh, number four, God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when needed to resolve a problem. There's a, there's a now defunct movement of uh, spiritual life coaches in a lot of churches. Um, the guy who was my CPE supervisor um, became a life coach in Dallas and that kind of blew up and went away. But you have these trends where 
anything other than focusing on the gospel. I need a life coach. Somebody's going to have to show me what I need to do. It's already there. And then five, good people go to heaven when they die. And I see this among a lot of adults. I spent a lot of my later years in, in the military and in civilian ministry and hospital ministry. And people would be on their deathbeds and we would talk to them about their faith and where, where are you at in all of this? Well, I've, I've done good. I've been a good person. I'm not as bad as so-and-so. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I, you know, they've got their little list of laws that they've kept. But that's not what's going to save you from the pit of hell. It's the salvation that's in Jesus Christ and is dying on the cross for us. That's where salvation is. And so we have to get back to understanding that. That is what Jesus taught. He said, I came into the world for this purpose. To give my life as a ransom for many. The good people, just on the, on the value of their being good alone, don't quite make it. Because everybody can find something good about themselves. Right? I can, I can compare myself to somebody that I'm better than, in my own opinion. Maybe not many, but maybe somebody's not as good as I am. <laughs> you see the folly of that? No, the Word of God says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and that we need a Savior, a savior to restore us to fellowship with the Lord. That Savior is Jesus the Christ. The seed of the woman way back in Genesis 3. The son of David. The Messiah. So, I have kind of a takeaway down here, and this is my polemic basically. What the church needs and what every church needs is a new reformation. There needs to be a new focus on and this begun in this church, by the way. I'm not saying not. I'm saying across the board in our denomination. Across the board in our sister churches in this town. There needs to be a new reformation, a focus on the teaching of Christ. And the doctrine that is sound, that was taught by the apostles, originally taught by them. Why? So we can know the truth. So the truth can set us free. So we can play the game of spot the lie. You know what that is? Kim and I play this game a lot when we're watching TV. You know, some commercial or some politician or some sales pitch comes on TV. We play this game spot the lie. What is it they're saying usually after the third sentence or so, that's a bald-faced lie. <laughs> really. Or at least it's an intentional deception. Spot the lie. You can't spot a lie if you don't know the truth. Isn't that right? So we have to know the truth. If we're listening for the truth and know the truth, it gives us health and well-being. But if we're, if we're hearing things that aren't accurate, that are false, that are false doctrine, and you know the truth, you can spot it right away. And you can be alert to it and disregard it and rebuke it. Because you know it's coming from the other pole, the other polarity. It's coming from the tares, not the wheat. Okay? There's also a need for catechizing. Anybody know what that is? It's not a, it's not a breeding of cats, just so you know. <laughs> catechizing is teaching. Catechism. Yeah, that's where the word catechism comes from. There needs to be a new focus on teaching the Word of God. From diapers to casket. Every age group. You don't need to try to be relevant. The gospel is relevant. It has the most relevant theme you could possibly come up with. That is life or death. 
Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and what? The life. <clears throat> you want to live in God? You want to have eternal life? Then you need to know the truth and believe it. Every teenager needs it. And I don't care what kind of music they like. I really don't. I mean, it doesn't matter. You have to think about our history as disciples of Christ for a minute. We've had, we have kind of a checkered history in a lot of ways, but one of the things we always said was, where the Bible speaks, we speak. And where it's silent, we're supposed to keep our mouths shut. <laughs> we can't do it. There's always been somebody who's got something else to add. Not just in discipledom, but everywhere. But we need to go back to that thing where the Bible speaks. That's what we want to really focus on. And in essentials, what? Unity. And in non-essentials, what? Liberty. Oh, wasn't it? And in all things, charity, love. So it's not important, particularly, whether a person plays a folk guitar or an acoustic guitar or an electric guitar or a tuba. That's irrelevant, actually. What we have to have is the truth. What those kids over across the street are looking for and needing so badly is the truth. They're going to school learning data. <laughs> I learned a lot of data in my life. You probably did too. And a lot of stuff I learned was the truth and a lot of stuff I learned was not the truth. But we have to focus on what's important. I want to read you just for a second um, Luther's preface to his small catechism. You remember Martin Luther was the great reformer who um, nailed uh, 95 Theses to the Wittenberg Chapel door and touched off a firestorm that became a movement called the Reformation. <clears throat> and after some time, he went back and around, was visiting in the Protestant churches. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the preface begins, Martin Luther, to all faithful and godly pastors and preachers, grace, mercy, and peace in Jesus Christ our Lord. The deplorable, miserable condition which I discovered lately when I too was a visitor has forced and urged me to prepare and publish this catechism or Christian doctrine in this small, plain, simple form. What manifold misery, so help me God, I beheld. The common people, especially in the villages, have no knowledge whatever of Christian doctrine, and alas, many pastors are altogether incapable or incompetent to teach, so much so that one is ashamed to speak of it. Nevertheless, all maintain that they are Christians, have been baptized and received the common holy sacraments. Yet they do not understand and cannot even recite either the Lord's Prayer or the Creed or the Ten Commandments. And this gets worse. They live like dumb brutes and irrational hogs. And yet, now that the gospel has come, they have nicely learned to abuse all liberty like experts. <laughs> well, you can see that he was a little firebrand there, but he saw the need for new teaching, new catechism, or new teaching of the old truth. And that is so true in our day and age as well. We need to focus on what God has given and put all the many distractions and all the many distortions and all the many false doctrines that come our way. Just put them aside. Get back to the bedrock Christian gospel because that, according to Paul in uh, Romans 1.16, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For that is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. So, hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that one can encourage others by sound doctrine 
and refuse, refute those who oppose it. Questions? Comments? Random outbursts? It's the truth. Yes. Let me mention one other thing while we're still rolling. Um, in our early days, in, in the, and even now, we say that um, where the Bible speaks, we speak. And then somebody says, well, what about all the differences and different theories and doctrines and stuff? I heard Pastor Paul say this when he first came to this church. I was so delighted to hear it. And I've heard him say it since then, too. But we didn't say just whatever you wanted to believe is okay. That's not what the disciples have ever said historically. What we have said is, where the Bible speaks, we speak. And so if you can present it and defend it from the Scripture, then we'll listen to it. If it's from some other source and it's off the wall or something you're making up, twisting the Word of God, we reject it. So everybody, there is some latitude in things that don't really matter. What does matter uh, is that we have a firm grasp of the gospel, first of all. That Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. And he came to save you too. And we focus our love and our attention on him. That's part of what it is to make Him our Lord. When we, when we have people come into the church, we say, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Okay, so far so good. Uh, and sometimes they add, have you made Him Lord of your life? Well, um, I don't know if anybody's ever said, well, now, time out, let me think about it. They're always going to say yes, but have they really? Is Christ the central focus? of what we think and say and do. It can become that. The Word of God has the power to change every motivation we have. When I came to Christ, or actually when He pulled me out of the ditch, I was on the way to hell in a big way. And I can still do all the things I used to do as much as I want to. But He's changed my want to. He's changed the person inside. He didn't just change it, He replaced it. All that stuff doesn't even appeal to me anymore. Why? Because I know that Christ appeals to me and He loves me and He doesn't want me to destroy myself. And He's not about to let the devil do it either. So we have liberty in God, but we have that liberty based on His truth. The truth will set you free. Not just you can do whatever you want to, but you can do whatever you want to in line with the truth. Okay, I'm not going to take an offering today. <laughs> Any questions, comments, random outbursts? Let's close with a word of prayer. Thank you, God, for your precious promises to us that you will never leave us nor forsake us, that you'll be with us until the end of the age, and that even in our feeble faltering, we sometimes fail to follow you. Our hearts yearn for you. We want to be your people. We want to focus on your love and your life, and especially on your son's teaching. Burn it into our consciousness, O God. Help us to spend time with Your Spirit and Your Word. Work within us to produce the people You've called us to be, for it can only come about by the power of Your Spirit. And we yield to that today and in the coming days. In the mighty name of Jesus the Christ. Amen.